Welcome to this session. My name is Ian MacDonald, in very small writing if you're at the back and you can't read it. Uh, I'm a principal technologist with Pyramid Analytics. You can find our booth literally just outside the back of the theater here. Uh, and please do come and talk to us during the rest of the day if anything you hear today or anything else uh, piques your, your interest. Um, I've given the title for this session of Don't Put the AI Cart Before the Data Horse. Um, a fairly kind of um, uh, mysterious title, I guess, and what, what is I going to be talking about? Really, it comes down to, I mean, I'm sure you're probably aware already uh, in your own work, uh, just make sure I get these slides going the right way. There we go. Is anything coming up yet? There we go. So you probably found out over the last you know, months, years, or work you've done in terms of uh, business analytics, business intelligence, that there's been a whole load of activity and a lot of hype and a lot of discussion around the application of machine learning algorithms, uh, artificial intelligence, etc., and trying to use some of those techniques in order to improve the decision-making quality within organizations and to work with you know, the huge amount of data that most organizations are generating on a regular basis. So this is something which a lot of organizations have been trying to do. And in fact, as you probably say, from my lack of hair and the gray beard, I've been doing this stuff for over 30 years. And back in the late 80s, early 90s, people were talking about data mining and so on and so forth. Uh, in the early 2000s, there was another wave around kind of business process automation. And we're going to see this again coming around the third time, if you like, in terms of application of some of these mathematical algorithms to the decision-making process of organizations. So it's something which is uh, on a kind of a, uh, a, a regular seasonal loop of probably about 10 to 15 years, I think, which comes up. And what's tended to happen in the previous two cycles is that there's a lot of interest and a lot of excitement but then the realization that actually it's pretty hard and that a lot of the results and the benefits that we're expecting to get from trying to understand my data, to understand the patterns and the trends that were occurring there um, is actually quite hard to determine. And more than that, it's harder to actually push the interpretation and the results of that in terms of positive action in the decision-making process of organizations. And so what I've seen over you know, the last 30 odd years is that you know, a lot of this stuff, it, it works well in terms of the initial program, there's a discovery, but then in terms of the automation process, it gets subsumed into more the transaction processing system. So again, you know, you're familiar with going out to Amazon and trying to buy something or any website these days, and you get bombarded with stuff about, oh, you, you might be interested in this, I see you're looking at that, how about you want to go and look at this, and so on. So that type of recommendation engine embedded in that sort of transaction processing and those web stores is where we see a lot of that stuff, that AI-driven stuff, crop up. You're also seeing it, obviously, these days, more modern examples, perhaps, in automated chatbots uh, and automated uh, AI agents trying to help you with your problem. Um, but that's, if you like, only a very sort of a, a very, very small subset and type of decision that we're trying to automate. And as we'll see in the next few slides, there's a lot of other things that I need to think about, other types of decisions, et cetera. So we've been trying to do this stuff for a long time, as we've seen. Uh, and when you go and look and talk to the analysts, as unfortunately I have to do as part of my job, but nevertheless, uh, I shall survive. But when I look at the stats from people like Forrester and Gartner, et cetera, a lot of companies have tried these types of activities, they've tried these projects, but have really failed to see a significant benefit in terms of the actual business itself. And that's particularly true where it's a technology-led project, which in my experience, they, they mostly tend to be. So at the end of the day, Despite all the advances in the technology, all of the improvements in some of the algorithms, although a lot of them are the same as I was using back in the late 1980s, 
But despite all of that, then that decision-making process itself has not been significantly improved, in my opinion. And the question you have to ask is, well, you know, why? I've spent a lot of time and money. I've hired some big brains. I've got these great algorithms. Um, but at the end of the day, it's benefited in a small part where it is relatively easy to automate that process, i.e. You know, the recommendation engines, etc. But from an overall organizational point of view, it's not really impacted or benefited the decision-making process for many organizations. So in terms of the why, well, the belief is that effectively that the technologies that I've been applying here um, will obviously you know, benefit and drive better business decisions and business outcomes. But the problem really doesn't really lie necessarily in the algorithms and what I'm actually doing, but the problem lies is about you know, what a decision actually is. And it's funny, it's I, I was actually, we were just closing down the booth yesterday and this elderly gentleman came on with a stick. And he's, he told me he was in his 80s or early 90s, I can't remember now. But he was asking me, we had this thing about decision uh, process management, etc. on our slide. And he's asking, well, what is a decision? What is the definition of a decision? And if you look within your own organizations, it's like, well, you know, who makes what types of decisions? How is it structured? How does it relate? What is the process? What are the different levels? What are the different time frames, and so on? So I can apply machine learning, AI techniques to my data for sure. I can get some good insight and information from that. But how does that actually impact any one particular decision that I want to make? And more importantly, how does it impact the entire decision-making framework within your organization? A lot of your decisions obviously hopefully are based on facts, but a lot of them also based on other things as well. And there's a whole kind of ecosystem of stuff we have to think about in terms of how people actually go about making their decisions. So the problem is that there's ambiguity in terms of you know, what is a decision, how do I want to address it, what level is it, what is time frame, and so on. The other thing is that, um, as I said, they don't really, you know, if I'm looking at those algorithms, they don't really define the, the model actual, they don't model the, the, the decision process itself. So they don't really understand the whole aspects of those decisions. And data and analytics trying to use the different types of analytics, but you kind of forget about the complexity of integrating the results of the algorithm back into the systems, the processes, and how people are then going to take actions to actually affect a change. If you like the last mile of the analytics problem. And you'll often find, well, when you talk to data scientists or analysts, that they'll have a particular favorite technology, a particular favorite technique, and it's often based on team preference and expertise, but not necessarily on whether it's actually the correct for the landscape of the business. And that landscape is usually more complex than uh, we can be achieved with that single tool, single application, and single technology. As a, a little bit of kind of a, um, uh, illustrate this point, it's a slide from Gartner. Um, they, they, they're talking uh, recently quite a lot about this topic. I'll refer back to them again in a moment. Um, but it's a useful chart just to think about, you know, the decision-making process within your organization. What Gartner analysts done in this case is looking at it from two dimensions in terms of you know, the level or the level of the typical decision maker and then the length of time it takes to make any one particular decision. And we were talking about recommendation engines and we were talking about, you know, the, you bought this, so how about you have a go and look at that. That kind of, in quotes, real time decision making, which is happening within a few seconds, is right down here, if you like, at the operational or production level. So that's typically where you see most of the AI stuff, most of the machine learning stuff being productionized, if you like, in terms of influencing and guiding the decisions that are being made. So this is stuff, this is where, this is where I build you know, my predictive models, I train it with my data. When I look at the attributes of the person coming through my website process and the choices they've made, 
I can push that through the model and get a set of uh, uh, questions to ask them or sort of things to suggest to them. And that's happening at a fairly kind of production level. It's every few seconds that's going through. When we move up the food chain of my decision management or decision point, point of view, we go up into operational management, tactical management, and strategic management. And here it's not quite so obvious how I can take some data, how I can analyze that, how I can derive insight to it by the use of machine learning algorithms, et cetera, plus more traditional statistical analysis and straightforward kind of charting and graphing. All of those will feed into these decisions over a certain amount of time and will influence or not influence depending upon obviously the data, the outcomes of that analysis, but also other sort of uh, more sort of human factors in terms of that decision making process. So when you look at that kind of AI ML stuff, I said from my experience, it has been very much focused in that operational space. Uh, you see there's you know, real time pricing on when you go to buy an airline ticket, real time pricing when you're buying and trying to insure your car. All of this stuff is being driven that close real time in the operational side but the question is, how do we actually better use some of those ML AI techniques, if you like, to address the decision-making process in a more complex, in more tactical, more strategic examples? So that's kind of an illustration of that. There are actually, I could you know, crack on with a whole bunch of other problems as well we're trying to uh, uh, address. Data and analyst leaders and AI enthusiasts are often more really focused on the accuracy of the algorithms and understanding the decisions that's going to be made as a result of them, and also the impact and effectiveness of that. And cultural aspects of automated decision making, uh, it can be a tricky one as well. Um, you know, you have to have a very high degree and a high level of trust in the data in fact, not just the data, but the algorithmic processes by which you've derived an insight in order to say, I'm going to base my decision primarily upon the output of that algorithm. And in my experience, again, the more strategic the business decision becomes, the higher up the food chain the management of decision is, the less trust there is on the outcomes of these things. So, after all of that, you know, what, where does that leave us? It seems a bit bleak, really. Well, there's a new phrase in town, you know, the next great thing. Uh, you may have come across it already. Some of is called decision intelligence. So we've heard about business intelligence. We've heard about you know, data analytics, machine learning. This new game in town, according to Gartner and co anyway, is something which is called decision intelligence. And it's about bringing together, a or providing a framework that brings together different aspects of the decision-making process into a unified view, unified platform to address the challenges that we've identified uh, in the last few slides. So how do we define that? Well, Gartner defines it as a framework that brings multiple traditional and advanced techniques together to design, model, align, execute, monitor, and tune decision models and processes. So it's not looking at any one specific algorithm, it's not looking at one specific machine learning activity, it's looking at that whole business process of decision making and asking, you know, can we do a better job of helping people in terms of not necessarily automate the entire thing, but to accelerate it, make it more accurate, make it better. Interestingly, uh, Google actually do have a head of decision intelligence, would you believe? And, what, uh, and, and that, uh, that person describes it as a new discipline that brings together the best of applied data science, social science, and managerial science to use data to improve the lives of business and lead AI projects. So when people often talk, I and mean, when we talk about you know, Amazon and their recommendation engine, when you're on Google and their searching algorithms, all that stuff, these guys are recognizing that that decision intelligence aspect of it, the wrapping up of those techniques in a more structured kind of decision-making process uh, is gonna be key to their future success. 
And indeed, as I say, Gartner are starting to recognize and see this trend in the in industry at the moment. So if we're talking about, we talked about you know, the, uh, you know, the importance of this stuff and the challenges we've had with AI and ML, but if I was to look at a decision intelligence platform, what would it look like? What kind of things are important? Well, you've seen already we talked about we have to work with data. We have to be able to do analysis. We have to incorporate AI, machine learning, et cetera. So you know, when we were designing the pyramid platform, we were looking at you know, three key areas. So what we call you know, the business analytics. So this is the stuff that you know, you're familiar with already, um, you know, the standard kind of business intelligence, business analytics type activity. We're also looking at data wrangling, the data preparation, accessing the data, be able to manipulate the data, transform the data, uh, reshape the data, if you like, so it's applicable and be, I can apply my uh, analytic tools to it. And also the integration of data science platform as well. So I need to be able to bring all of these three things together. I need to access, manage, manipulate, transform, shape the data. I need to be able to integrate data science with it, as well as my traditional business analytics. So it's that holistic approach and merging those three disciplines, if you like, but not just for technical people, but across all business users, and add in a lot of those social aspects that we've been discussed as well. So collaboration, sharing, reuse, be able to engage in commentary, annotation, conversations, be able to define and subscribe to content as I need, and automate distribution of information to key stakeholders as well. So, you know, from a um, data analytics, business intelligence, machine learning, algorithmic aspect, you know, that's those three key areas, and add in the social aspects of that as well. But the other thing we need to think about in terms of what we call the, the fundamental pillars for that decision intelligence platform. So I need to be able to have full access to analytic capability from a self-service point of view with sophistication, simplicity, and universal client access. I also need to have, you said, that collaboration, share the ability to share business logic and to share qualitative insight. Um, uh, if I could completely automate my decision process with the data that I have, I could sack all my managers and turn all the lights off. But we all know that that's never going to work. There's always information I need which is qualitative in nature, which I need to bring to bear on that decision-making process. So I need some way of capturing that. And I, again, you know, if, you were, if you're living in a bubble and you're looking at the sales data for you know, 2018, 2019, 2020, what's happened? There's nothing in the data itself to say that there was a worldwide pandemic. It just see that my sales have dropped through the floor. So without bringing that external information in, I may not be able to interpret the output of some of the analytics accurately. And I need a way of capturing that, annotate the analytics, annotate the data, share, collaborate on that information as well as the hard kind of numerical stuff. And then the other key area is to be able to manage this environment. So you know, it's all great being able to do this stuff, but if we need an army of people to manage and supervise and control the platform, the systems, et cetera, then it's not gonna be cost effective and it's gonna be difficult and it's gonna be time consuming. So another key aspect then of manageability is the governance and security in terms of the content, how it's accessed, what content is created, who has access to that, what data, obviously, and so on. The ability to work with your data where it is in the format in which it is stored. So again, I don't want to have the necessity of having to duplicate data, move it around, ingest it into proprietary engines, and so on and so forth. And of course, I want a flexible deployment. I want to be able to put this on-prem. I want to have it in the cloud. It may probably have a hybrid solution of both. So I don't want any barriers of that either. Where we see the kind of beneficiaries of this is obviously business users and users on the left, organizationally on the right. And the output of this from a benefit point of view for the organization, the speed, efficiency, and scalability and reliability and trust, which is another key aspect. 
So this is why I'm talking about you know, the, um, uh, the data, data uh, the cart before the horse. The horse in this case, I think, is that solid data, found data foundation that has to be in place, that has to be able to actually work with your data where it is. You have to have trust in that. You have to have the governance and the security around that. It has to be easy to get at, it has to be manageable, it has to be shareable, it has to be reusable, and so on and so on and so on. So this is you know, the core foundation before you start moving on to the AI, ML stuff, and our decision platforms, the data piece is absolutely critical. So in support of that, when I'm looking at Pyramid as an example from a you know, architectural and stuff point of view, then you know, critically, you know, I everything is no desktop component, everything is server side. Key to the actual processing of this is uh, we until this is our, our query engine. So we need somewhere and somehow of actually going to get the data, wherever it may be, without ingesting into a proprietary format, where I can work directly with relational data, with multidimensional data, with data in uh, blob storage, et cetera, on my cloud, et cetera. But I don't want to impact my performance of this, okay? I want to be able to operate there, working, if you like, in place analytics on that data uh, uh, fast and efficiently. And also to have no differential. So no matter what the data format is stored in, to have the full range of analytics that I can actually apply to it and not have that influenced by the storage engine that I'm working with. To that, we start bringing in some of the kind of AI, ML, smart tool stuff. So the embedding of some of the techniques we've talked about already, so things like natural language chatbots, the ability to query the data through natural language, uh, through my dashboards or whatever it might be. Something called uh, explain analysis. So this is what we'll look and we'll show you, you know, the key drivers for any particular outcome, both in terms of the data, in terms of the variables, and so on. Smart insights and smart modeling, the ability to simply to drop a bunch of data into the system, have it work out what the data relationships are, and to be able to ge automatically generate, with something called auto-discovery, generate a whole set of analyses compiled into a book or a dashboard which is immediately available to uh, you know, without you know, a human intervention, as they say. All of this is based around uh, effectively semantic models. So I need some way of describing my data, where it is, what format it's in, how it relates to other data, and so on. I may need to have some data wrangling capability, transforming it, reshaping it, depending upon what it is that I want to do with it. And of course, support for those data science, machine learning capabilities, designing and building those algorithms alongside a pre-built library of you know, drag and drop uh, blocks to actually do common activities. All of that, of course, driven straight into that your data, wherever it may reside. And on the other side is the ability to extend this through uh, direct access into that data, having this as a uh, if you like, a semantic platform which can deliver data through standard data models to other tools as well. And to also provide that, that hybrid data, hybrid location, on-prem, cloud, et cetera. Key thing on this one though, what, you know, it's a kind of a so what question, what does that actually give you? And, and from that point of view, the outcomes of this is things like change resilience. So from here, you know, I can make sure that um, I can have shareable standards, that I can change data sources on the fly without affecting the actual data model itself. We have the ability here to then, from a user empowerment point of view, that self-service, real self-service, uh, user acceptance, uh, elimination of those bottlenecks and so on, and also the breadth and capability and the governance that we talked about coupled with this performance and the scalability. If you like, what we're trying to do here is address what we being called the, um, you know, the, 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 the decision intelligence supply chain. So when I'm working with data, I'm going to go through, and you know, when you're building a you know, set of products in your factory, you're acquiring raw materials, you're enriching them by molding them, injecting them, pressing them in different shapes, I assemble them into the products, and I deliver them to the market. 
And then from my consumer point of view, I want to you know, work with those products and use them as I see fit. So from a decision and data point of view, we can look at it in the same aspects. I need to acquire data, I need to enrich it, I need to create content from it, I need to be able to do you know, further work and calculations and deliver that into my users or my consumers who are gonna want to further explore and collaborate through that decision cycle with subscriptions, alerts, conversations, etc. And then finally, I need to address you know, all the different types. So not just data scientists, not just type uh, high-end you know, uh, data analysts and, and data engineers, but to actually make this accessible across the business and to be able to, in fact, provide a customized environment for any individual or team which matches the functionality of what they have access to to what they actually need to do as part of their business and not overwhelm them with too much sophistication. So that was it, really, in, uh, in terms. I've got a couple of minutes left, so time for a couple of questions if you wish. Uh, we can also go and, go and have a look, uh, talk to us on the booth, which is just at the back of the theater here. Uh, if you come out and turn right, like that, and just opposite us there. Uh, and you can also obviously go and look at some of the analysts in this space that, uh, that we talked to and have published uh, reviews and analyses of, of our products, our technologies, and our services. So thank you very much for your attention. It's been a pleasure to present to you today. It's absolutely great to be back in person at these events rather than 18 months of, what? You're muted. Turn your microphone on and all that stuff, as you're probably familiar with. So it's great to be here. Great to see you all. Um, thank you very much.